Colleagues, thank you so much for joining us. A very good uh, morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I am Sipiso Makwetla, I'm your moderator. Welcome to the WHO and APO Group online press briefing on COVID-19. As you know that uh, for the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at various aspects of COVID-19 and how it's affected countries on the African continent. The pandemic is obviously a global one and education systems globally have not been spared. So today we'll be looking at that, how COVID-19 has impacted not only families, student learners, but uh, has also had a social and economic impact. So let me just let you know who the panelists are this afternoon. We will be joined by Dr. Matsiri Somwedu, who's the WHO Regional Director for Africa. In Nairobi, Kenya is uh, Mohamed Malik Fall, who is UNICEF's Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa. The two organizations have been working on a study to look at uh, how schooling, education in general has been affected. Of course, the resources that are required. Let me also let you know that uh, Dr. Nsenga Goy, who's the WHO's COVID-19 Incident Manager, also joins Dr. Muedi. A uh, few house rules, as you know, please ensure that you use the Q&A section. If you want to raise a question, please identify yourself, the organization whom you're representing, as well as to whom you'd like to pose a question. This is a uh, dual simulcast in English and French. So please look at the bottom, the icon, the globe icon on your Zoom app is where you can change your interpretation to English or France. So please make that selection now. François. Bonjour et merci de vous être connecté à ce briefing. Donc, si vous voulez euh, entendre l'audio en français, il y a une option pour ce faire. Il faut cliquer sur euh, l'interprétation dans les options de Zoom qui ressemble à un globe et sélectionner le langage français. Thank you very much, Francho. So we'll be talking about the reopening of schools in Africa. Many of them have been completely shut down. We turn to Dr. Mwedi now to talk about the harms that children face with school closures. Dr. Mwedi, it's over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sepiso. Um, and I'd like to say a warm welcome and thank you to all the journalists uh, who are joining us today. And of course, a lot of thanks to our APO group colleagues. I'm so very pleased to be joined by Mohamed Fall, my colleague and friend, and the UNICEF Regional Director for East and Southern Africa, to discuss the reopening of schools because this issue needs to be addressed with the same urgency that we've seen in opening up economies and businesses. Children are our future and education is a pathway out of poverty towards prosperity and better health for the African continent and for the world. The decision to open schools or not amid the pandemic is a difficult one, but we must find the right balance to avoid trading one adversity for another. The longer that children are out of school, the greater the risk that they may not return to school. School closures are potentially exacerbating risks of teenage pregnancies, of violence against children, of substance abuse, of anxiety, loneliness, and isolation. At least 18 million children in Sub-Saharan Africa benefit from school meals and in households that are struggling to make ends meet, children being out of school contributes to increased food insecurity. Modeling by the World Bank indicates that school closures in Sub-Saharan Africa could lead to losses in lifetime earnings of 4,500 US dollars per child. This is something clearly that we cannot afford. So WHO's advice is to weigh the risks, to use the data on COVID-19 cases in the locality, Oops. 
and to guide decisions on reopening and to put in place measures to enable physical distancing, like spacing desks, moving classes outside, and staggering start and finish times, as well as ensuring students wear masks and are able to wash your, their hands. These are substantial challenges to overcome. Only around one in five schools in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, has soap and water available for students. Fewer than one in five households has internet access, making it difficult to move learning online. The perception of risk is also low among some young people, but even though they may only experience mild symptoms, their teachers and the elders they live with may be at high risk of contracting COVID-19 from infected young people and developing severe illness. Furthermore, when opening schools, Strong surveillance, testing, isolation, and contact tracing capacities are also important to quickly detect and respond in the event of flare-ups within and outside the school. And as we move forward, a collective effort is needed to shield older people and those with underlying illnesses. And we can do this by wearing masks, washing our hands frequently, and keeping a distance from each other. We are continuing to see fewer cases reported in the WHO African region, dropping from 73,000 new cases last week to 55,000 new cases in the past seven days. Reductions in cases in South Africa are largely driving this change. This progress is encouraging, but we cannot be complacent. Cases are continuing to increase in some countries particularly as borders, businesses, and schools are opening up. I look forward to our conversation today, and I thank you again so much for joining us here. Thank you very much, Sekiso. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Mwedi. And we now get a perspective uh, from UNICEF that is... Uh, uh, Dr. Mohamed Fall, who is UNICEF's Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa. Can you talk to us about why we should open schools again, especially given the concerns that Dr. Amuriti has highlighted, that uh, teachers and families are placed at risk because of interacting with children who may be affected? Thank you so much, Sidisa, um, for, for, for your introductory remark. Um, let me first um, greet uh, my sister and friend, Dr. Moiti, and thank her for giving us opportunity to be part of this uh, engagement with the press and greet all the colleagues from the media and say that it's uh, a pleasure to have this opportunity to discuss a um, few issues related to school reopening or related to the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the education system. Let me first say, by, um, I just wanted to share maybe three of four points. Uh, one is that uh, the crisis of COVID-19 we are in um, has triggered uh, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented for our lifetime of uh, education crisis in terms of scope, in terms of duration, and in terms of impact. In Eastern and Southern Africa, in the onset of the crisis, we were talking about 140 million children uh, who was deprived from the chance to have um, access to education. And even though uh, with time we see that uh, partial reopening was taking place here, support was doing provided for distance learning, we are still seeing that uh, in the region of Eastern and Southern Africa, we still have like 75 million children uh, who are not um, having opportunity to learn. Um, there are some issues that was raised already by Dr. Moiti in terms of losing opportunity even to return to school. We have seen with unprecedented outbreak that sometimes 20 to 25 percent of children who are attending school might lose the chance of coming back after this kind of long interruption. And that's what we have seen with the outbreak of Ebola in some West African countries. We have seen also that uh, this region, before even this COVID-19 crisis, was confronted with what we were calling the learning crisis. One aspect of this learning crisis is the large number of children who were already out of school. 
And the other one is that those who had chance to go to school were confronted with poor quality of learning, poor quality of outcome. And what we are afraid of is that this crisis and this long disruption of the school's education services could exacerbate those challenges that was pre-existing before the crisis. Furthermore, I think keeping children away also further exposed them to risks that are known, risk of being emotionally, physically, and even to a certain extent sexually abused. That is clear indication of things that we are seeing. All the monitoring system we have set online and direct monitoring are showing an increased number of children or increased report of children who are facing abuses or children or even teenage pregnancy in many countries of the, of, of, of the region. Um, I just wanted maybe to say a word around the reason why we feel that it's important today that we discuss and we reopen school. Um, so far, science and data as mentioned by Dr. Moiti have shown that children are not the biggest bearer of the disease. We have seen in many countries that um, the age group from five to 18, and who are the age group for primary and secondary school, are just 2.5% of the confirmed case of COVID across the country we are working in. And then making it clear that uh, if there was a carrier of the disease or a risk of spreading transmission, the highest risk is not in this uh, age group. Um, we also see that uh, with the measure and the framework which was discussed by the international community to support government for reopening school, there are some preventive measures that are in the framework um, to which Dr. Moiti referred to, which could be hand washing, uh, um, um, facilities enhancement, um, temperature check, spacing and reducing the size of the classroom. All of these also are measures that not only prevent the spread and the transmission, but they are measures also that can help to enhance the quality of the learning environment. And one point we are trying to look for this crisis is not only to address the challenge, but also to see opportunity of building back better or doing things better than what they were. Having more facility of hygiene and sanitation in school, um, having classroom sites that are much more manageable, um, having the, 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 the learning space organized in a way that is more conducive for quality learning is also something. Maybe I will finish with one word by saying that we are observing now with time and with the trajectory of the pandemic that uh, more and more measures are taken to reopen slowly um, from business to travel, different work of life which impact on the economy. And I think those sectors involve more adults that are having higher risk than, for example, children, as I said earlier, making it uh, more compelling for us for countries and for government, for parents, for teacher association, um, for Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health to get together on the consensus around reopening of school. Um, last note is just also to mention, of course, the challenge that all parents, starting from myself, are going through by not only becoming workers and doing their traditional job, but at the same time transforming themselves as a teacher or as a learning support, which sometimes they are not qualified for doing. And if we are not careful, the other risk I'm seeing is also, also maintaining the school closed could deepen the divide and the inequalities in terms of uh, uh, wealth or in terms of a family situation based on uh, um, the children who are much wealthier compared to those uh, who belong to the most vulnerable or the poorest family. Back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. I think a very rich um, um, history of what we're going through. And I think many of them, we haven't thought about the fact that you said not only are 140 million children affected, but uh, many of them also face the risk of abuse when going back to school. And some may not come back into the education system. So thank you very much for your contribution. Just to my colleagues, please remember to use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask your questions. Please identify yourself and your organization and to whom you'd like to pose a question. 
So we've already had uh, some questions come through. I'd like to read this one from Odiambo, Rhoda Odiambo from BBC Africa. Dr. Mwedi, if you could answer it, and Dr. Paul, if you also want to contribute to it. So it's about how countries are planning to reopen schools and what measures should governments be putting in place to impede the spread of COVID-19. The other question is what concerns the WHO has and as far as kids contracting the virus in relation to schools reopening. Um, what, what are the silent spreaders as well? This is the question from Rhoda Odiambo. Dr. Mwedi. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. You know, WHO has um, issued some guidelines on reopening schools in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think the principles are essentially that we need to keep the distance between children who are in school. So we should not have concentration, congregations of children in such a way that this distance cannot be kept. And then in addition to that, uh, children need to be encouraged, required to wear masks and very much children should be supported to adopt these hygiene measures, washing their hands frequently, using a sanitizer, avoiding touching the same things, pens, books, from one child to the other where the risk of transmission of the virus could happen. So this implies then that the scheduling of classes might have to change. In most African schools, we know that it's not possible to suddenly expand the space so that you can have more distance between the desks where children are sitting. So it might imply then having a sequential um, classes. So it also then implies that you need to look at the teachers who'd be available. Mohammed would be more able to speak to this than I am since he's involved more in education. But the principle is that we cannot have children uh, together in schools in the kind of quite overcrowded or, any, or even normal circumstances close to each other. We must make every effort to keep the distance between them. And then we have to put those barriers to transmission of the virus in case some children are infected or not. Um, and then such you know, activities as some of the sporting activities or major school events where you get children gathering in large numbers with, with, with adults need to be, to be avoided. Uh, what, what I've also seen is that uh, there's a progressive restarting of classes. No, so not starting everybody at the same time. There is also an attempt to separate different uh, age groups of children. And uh, of course, and I'll leave this to Mohammed, uh, concentrate on the ones where it's most urgent for the kids to be back in school if there's some sort of milestone exam that children have to go through. I think what needs to be, from the safety point of view, it is keeping a distance, it is the, the children not transmitting the virus to each other through the wearing of masks, and it is very much paying attention to hygiene, water and, water and soap, and the sanitizers if, if that is necessary. Mohammed, perhaps I'll turn it over to you to say more about this. Yeah, th thanks a lot. And I saw in the chat box one question in French directly addressed to me and kindly requesting me also that I provide the response in French. But maybe before I go to that one on what we are expecting from the African government, I would just say that um, given the scope and the impact of the school closure, I mean, I spoke about 140 million over 21 countries. And if you have gone beyond the continent or in the world, at some point people were looking at over a billion of children that were affected by this disruption. It is difficult that when we talk about reopening that everything happened at the same time with the same modalities as the contexts are not the same. This is why I think when we are advising government and engaging with them, we use the arguments that I have mentioned earlier, which was that the people wait in our soul, what are the consequences of this disruption? In terms of education, and I like the arguments you made earlier, Dr. Moiti, in terms of even economic loss, when you consider, for example, the time, in a context where we have already a learning crisis. In terms of also maybe chance of not returning to school forever, in terms mainly also of losing the protective dimension of education when it comes to abuse, when it comes to risk that children are exposed to. 
This is why I think people have to go in an approach which is specific to the context. And of course, when we call for school reopening, we call for school reopening by providing also a guidance and a framework which spell out clearly what are the requirements for a school to open. For sure, having water and sanitation facility which help children to wash their hand, to sanitize their hand is criteria that is extremely important, which to me goes even beyond the issue of, uh, of, of, of COVID, but enhance and reinforce the public health measure in an environment such as a school. Prior to COVID also, organizations like WHO and UNICEF was always active on promoting hygiene and health within school context. Second, creating the condition in which the congestions that we were afraid of in terms of distance is avoided. Now, it could be by reorganizing classes into shifts that have smaller number of children. It could be by avoiding maybe indoor class if wherever it's possible. It is this kind of measure. It's also in this distance, we are not talking about it only between children, but it's also a distance that needs to be observed between children and between students and their teachers. We were also thinking about, you know, temperature detections and by seeing children who could have signs and symptoms. This is just to say that when we are calling for school reopening, it is also in a framework which is set a kind of measure and step to be observed in a way that it will reduce also the risk of transmission among children from children to teachers or from children uh, to, to, to families or, 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 to, or to community. Of course, all of this also backed by the science and backed by some experience that are developed here and there that clearly indicate that the prevalence and the transmission risk related to children so far based on the data and on the science is extremely low. Using also another uh, 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 point which is that uh, what we know also is that uh, just being right on the science side is not enough in a context like of the one of today. I think we want to be right in terms of data and science, but also we want to open a dialogue and be able to convince and persuade parents, teacher unions, government, that this is the direction to take. And that's the step we are taking in, not to come in a very forceful way and say open school or put it as a matter of let's open or not open, but find also the evidence, find also the precondition. Now, um, just maybe when I was hearing the question, I was a bit smiling because, uh, um, you know, um, given my position, I'm so attached to everything that is in the child right. And uh, I didn't want also that this context be used for a chance or a possibility of stigmatizing children, saying that the children are silent spreaders, uh, make me smile because I think we haven't got enough evidence for saying so. And since they are our children, we need to nurture them and we need to groom them. Maybe we might avoid a label that could maybe stigmatize them uh, or that could put them in a position which, by the way, on top of everything, is not demonstrated by uh, the science. Maybe if I can take and shift briefly to French. Um, to aux amis qui ont posé la question de savoir qu'est-ce qu'on fait avec les gouvernements africains, je voudrais répondre que, comme j'ai dit tout à l'heure, il y a un engagement qui se fait au niveau pays, quelquefois même au niveau local, mais il y a un engagement aussi qui se fait au niveau régional. On a des engagements avec l'Union africaine, Et on a des engagements avec les organisations sous-régionales, je pense à SADEC, je pense à IGAD, je pense à ESI, qui sont des organisations qui nous permettent aussi d'avoir um, un dialogue, d'avoir une plaidoyer avec les gouvernements africains pour leur montrer que la meilleure voie à suivre et les risques um, qui sont liés à la reprise des écoles sont moindres comparés aux risques auxquels les enfants sont exposés en se mettant dans une position d'interruption des activités éducatives um, aussi longtemps que nous l'avons vu depuis le début de la crise. Over to you, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Paul. So let's move on to the other questions that have come through. This one is from Mainaro Ruru University World News, Kenya. It's uh, to you, Dr. Mweti and Dr. Ngoi, if you'd also like to 
contribute, please go ahead. Let's start with you, though, Dr. Murthy. So the question is about uh, asymptomatism and how minor says as many as 80% of new COVID cases are due to this. And she mentions uh, Kenya, what your point of view is of governments enlisting healthcare workers, community healthcare workers, regulations and protocols in managing COVID-19. Dr. Moiti? Um, yes, uh, thanks very much for, for, that, for that question. Um, I think that estimate of 80% um, of people who are infected or new patients being, uh, or cases of people who are infected being asymptomatic is pretty much what we are seeing all over the world. I think the global picture is between 65 and 94 percent of confirmed cases being asymptomatic. Um, I mean, of course, what WHO recommends is that when people are infected, even if they are asymptomatic, these people should be isolated for some length of time, at least uh, up to seven days following their confirmed test, and expectation being that by the 10th day of their diagnosis, most asymptomatic cases no longer being able to spread the infection. In most countries, in fact, this isolation is standardized at about 14 days. WHO issued some, some guidelines which indicates this duration may be, may be reduced. Um, and then as far as um, healthcare workers are concerned, of course, one of, the, one of the most important things to do is to make sure that they have all the required supplies in order to protect themselves and to prevent themselves being transmitters to their patients and members of the public of, of the infection. It, you know, it, it, it goes beyond people having gloves and masks and uh, gowns. It very much is related to their knowledge and their attitudes and their compliance with these rules. It means people need to be reminded, to be encouraged. There needs to be some way of finding out if they are enabled in, in every way possible to adopt these safety practices because we've seen that healthcare facilities, the healthcare settings can really be uh, places where the, the virus is spread. I think that is what is, is required and the WHO has um, issued guidance. We have trained a lot of healthcare workers on infection prevention and control remotely around the region once we could not move around. And we expect that then these be sustained. Unfortunately, one of the biggest challenges at the global level is the availability of PPE. And we are working with others, including with the African Union, to encourage the local and regional production of some of these items in Africa so that uh, the access can be improved. Thank Dr. You. Wait, may I just ask a question? And I think this is something that probably many journalists are also wondering is about the figures on, I think you said we're seeing something like 50 new cases a day, and that's how Hi, much so cases. Sorry, I'm struggling to of case couldn't that the number of cases are indeed dropping. I think. It's, okay, can you hear me now, Doctor? I can hear you now. There was some distortion, and you. I was hearing you very slowly. Connection issues, I think. So I was saying that I think this is a question many journalists would ask. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the number of cases have dropped drastically on the continent, uh, uh, primarily due to the drop in South Africa at 55 new cases a day. But if you're saying up to 85% of positive cases globally are asymptomatic, are we really certain that the number of COVID-19 cases are indeed dropping? Um, yes, I, I think we are certain of the direction in which things are going, but as I've already said several times in the past, we may not be finding every single asymptomatic or even some of the early, early cases. I think it very much depends on the testing capacity and on the testing strategies of different countries. In a country like South Africa, for example, the, you know, the, the, the government went out initially, the, what was being tested the people being tested were those who were presenting with symptoms. There was some encouragement of the public to come in and present with early symptoms. And then the government went on a very aggressive testing drive, testing at the community level, testing people who were asymptomatic. And what I recall is that we saw different rates of um, positivity 
in different localities in the country. For example, in the hotspots like um, at that time, the Western Cape and then the Eastern Cape and in Gauteng, we were seeing higher rates of infection in those places. But in other parts of the country, like um, the Northwest, Mpumalanga, other areas, the, the, the testing rates at, at a certain moment in time, when this uh, outreach case finding was happening, we were finding 3% of those who were tested were positive. Meaning that with a strategy that's being adopted now of more of a focus around healthcare facilities, encouraging uh, and, and their contacts, of course, the contacts of people who've been found to be positive, we are becoming more and more accurate in identifying cases. And I think one of the key things, as I said, uh, one of the, the, as we've said in the past, one of the challenges has been access to the testing uh, supplies as well. So countries are using their testing supplies as efficiently as possible while minimizing um, the, the missing cases. There are, there are other countries, countries like Botswana, Seychelles, the more middle income countries who are able to get out and buy more supplies where the positivity rates have been around 5%. And then we have other countries like uh, Ethiopia, Madagascar, where we see higher positivity rates, the 15% sometimes where, of course, we're encouraging expanding testing. All this to say, we think that the trends we are seeing are real um, because where testing has been increased, we've seen a slight increase, but not a huge increase in the positivity rate that, that implies that we were missing many, many cases. We acknowledge that there's some degree of undercounting because the, the testing is not the same everywhere and not every country can go out with looking for cases. But we, we believe that the trend that we are seeing, except in the countries where we are seeing an increase, Ethiopia, Madagascar, there are several countries where we are seeing an increase in, in, in cases that we are overall seeing a decrease, at least in the rate of increase, meaning it's no longer exponential. Even in South Africa, we're seeing a decrease in the rate of increase. And that's one of the countries where the most testing is being carried out on the continent. Right. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. I've got a question from Koya Foster, German press agency. And it's to you, Dr. Paul. It's about what do you think of Kenya's decision? So do you think that this is a number of COVID-19 cases that we're seeing on African countries, is it likely to be a higher number than reported? Please uh, share your thoughts about this. And uh, they also ask about the number of antibody studies in African countries, by the way. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll pass this over to Dr. Nsengangoy just to bring him into the discussion and also because there was some distortion, I, I didn't hear the, all of your questions. Okay. So the, it was, uh, so, Dr. Mwedi, if uh, we can allow uh, Dr. Paul to all answer the question first, and then we'll go to Dr. Ngoi. Ah, okay. Sorry. Can you hear us, Dr. Paul? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. But uh, my the part of the question I got was on the epidemiology. Uh, um, which I was going to leave to Dr. Moiti and Dr. Um, Angoy. But I saw in the chat box two questions that was directly to me. One was on the number of uh, um, children that I referred to as a direct consequence of the COVID. And I think I just wanted to clarify that uh, in the onset of the crisis, when the first um, restriction and lockdown measure was put, um, in 21 countries out of 20 in our region, we saw that uh, one of the first measures was school closure. And the closing had led to a disruption for 140 million children um, going from pre-primary to primary to uh, um, post-primary uh, um, level. And then the support started through distance learning and the support started also after a few weeks by seeing few countries taking steps to reopen school only in a staggered way, sometimes for children who, are, uh, need, who need to sit and write exams. This is why we say that that number of 140 million, which was in the beginning, finally translated into 75 million children who did not have um, the opportunity of learning despite the effort of reopening or despite the effort of providing 
distance learning. Just to give an idea of a number of children who are really exposed, not only to the direct consequences of the school opening, but also to the unintended consequences of school opening. And there was a question also asking um, if enough is done toward government to look at these issues of uh, um, school reopening, knowing that more and more we are gathering evidence that we, if the required and prerequisites are there, the risk of transmission among children or from children is much lower than maybe it is perceived. I think there is a need to insist and continue to advocate through the government, as I said earlier, at a national level, at a local level, going from maybe Ministry of Education to Ministry of Health, looking at also how to bring in parents, how to bring in teachers and their unions. All of these part, the segments have to participate into this process of dialogue for the school reopening. And as I say, when we insist so much on the school reopening, it's not only based on the scientific evidence or data, but it's based also on the in intended and in unintended consequences that it has from the education system. As I say, the learning crisis we were facing, as I say, the risk of uh, increasing by millions the number of out of school, that uh, was already a challenge in this part of the world, but at the same time also impacting drastically in the learning outcome, which was already characterized as extremely low. And that's the point that Dr. Moiti was raising by saying that even in terms of GDP growth or in terms of economic consequences, it might huge or drive to a huge loss for the economy of this region. But I wanted to insist also on some other aspects which I have referred to earlier. One of them being the protection issues that how it affects children in terms of being exposed to risk of exploitation, abuse from physical point of view, from emotional point of view. Also, the risk of putting children in a distressed situation, which is, you know, all the mental health issues. We all know when children are confined or locked down in a limited space, they cannot go to recreational activities, they cannot connect to friends, all the kind of consequences that it could have. But it can also deepen the inequalities that characterize the social economic situation of our region. We know that in many places, wealthy children or children coming from wealthy family have more opportunity to good go into a good learning conditions. And we are seeing this also during the interruption and the disruption of the education system. Those who come from wealthier family can have access to digital platform and go through a process of distance learning. But there are people who even don't have power at home, let alone now talking about uh, digital or a platform or computer, which could help them. Or whose parents' education doesn't allow them even to give them the minimum support that one would need um, to get into this kind of distance learning. And this risk of also further dividing the society and the context of our countries is there. And I think that's the kind of arguments and package that we are engaging with the government to show them that if you compare the low risk of transmission, which have been proven by scientific data, to the other consequences that are directly impacting on the education level and the unintended consequences that it have on child development and on child protection, we believe that it is urgent that really government consider in a way to which they would be supported and guided, but consider reopening school. Um, I'm respecting all the conditions and the prerequisites that we spoke uh, at length uh, about. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fu. So we've got a question here from, so it's the same question from um, Goy Foster from the German press agency. Dr. Ngoy, let's pass it on to you it's about what your thoughts are on the fact that uh, Kenya has decided to shut down the entire school year. Another follow-up question to that is about the antibody studies being done in African countries and how they show that the number of COVID cases is likely much higher than the number reported. And uh, they're asking uh, how is that a positive, I mean, possible if the number of COVID-19 deaths is comparatively low. Dr. Ngoi? Uh, thank you very much, Davis. Uh, I think the, I'll start with the question about uh, the, the, the antibody survey that was conducted in Kenya and some other countries, and I believe in, in Mozambique, which I think is related to the question of uh, high, high uh, numbers or percentage of uh, asymptomatic cases. 
first to state that if you have in a country many asymptomatic cases, it's not a bad issue by itself. Because as Dr. Moiti said, this is what has been observed around the world. But beyond that, it means you are actually testing people who might need, might, might have been missed, but you are catching them in your testing. Because if you only test those who are symptomatic, it means those who are not symptomatic. Because we know from around the world that whoever catch the, the virus, only about 15% make uh, a, a symptom going from mild to severe to critical. Then if you are only catching those with symptoms, it means you, are massing, you are, might be missing a mass of other people who are already infected. So now that's why Dr. Boit was linking that with the positivity rate. It's also a trend to show you if you are catching only those who are supposed to be caught and you are missing another part of number of, of people who are already infected, and then you might be uh, actually chasing a kid which uh, is, is already passing or the, the disease is passing. So this is how we understand the, 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 the highest number of asymptomatic. It's not bad by itself. Now, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 the, 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 the serology, that's how we call it, uh, the antibody survey that we conduct in some countries, yes, it is shown in Mozambique, I think in Delgado, uh, Delgado uh, province, and in Kenya, according to the, the report I read, is one to 6% uh, of people who have been infected. Uh, but we have to understand this in the context of that survey. One, what is the context? The context is the test they use was antibody, as you rightly said uh, at the episode. The antibody, it does not mean that the person is sick at the, at the time he's being tested. It means the person has been exposed in the past to the virus. So that's what uh, the antibody means. Then the other context of the, the survey we have to look at is the sample itself, who were tested. If you look at the, the survey, in the Delvo Calgado in Mozambique, it was the adults and then the vendors, then the drug who are people who are most likely to get infected because of their activities. So you need to understand that survey in the context of the survey itself, how it was done, the context, the, the sample, and the method of testing that was, that was conducted. Now, in terms of school, I think we also need to understand the side of the government and the side of all of us. So at, the, at the beginning of the outbreak or the pandemic when it was coming in Africa, First of all, we had the experience of other countries. We didn't have experience how will it all in our context as Africa. So measure was taken based on what we knew at that time. Then that's so countries closed the school, closed all the clinical services and, and the other, other places just to at least make sure that we are as much as possible protecting as many people as possible. Today in Africa, we have the among the lowest number of cases. I think in part is because some of the, the, our countries and including with uh, support from partners, uh, UNICEF, WHO and others, took the right measure at the right time. So now, as, uh, as Mohammed was saying, now it's time to assess uh, where we are in terms of infection and infection spread in the community and the way we are in terms of the impact on our economy, on our school and other sectors. So this is where, where we are. So we can't at, at this point, I think, throw a stone to the government because at that time, they closed all the schools. This is, I think, what it was understood by the time. And now is the time to assess where we are and to take measure accordingly. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngoy. This question, uh, Dr. Fall, I'll to you and Dr. Moitu, if you'd like to weigh in, we happy to hear from you as well. So it's from Stephen Kirker in South Africa. So Stephen is asking about the resources that can be provided through the WHO and other UN organizations in helping poorly resourced countries for them to provide the level of prevention which is required or prevention measures which are required, and also pointed to the fact that children by their very nature are impulsive. So how do you also police that? Dr. Paul? 
Thank, thank you so much. Uh, um, I think I would just quickly say that um, there are a lot of framework that has been um, put in place, and I just want to refer to the international community stance to support education and to support schools. I mean, uh, there was a framework which was already um, and guidelines that was issued by WFP. And I think uh, Dr. Moiti spoke earlier about one of the importance of children being to school is the feeding. I mean, we are talking about 18 million of children in this region were given food um, because they were going to education. One of the other unintended consequences. So it's a lost opportunity. Um, WFP is very much engaged. We have the um, um, WHO, we have the um, um, World Bank, we have UNESCO. Almost all the partners in the international community are working together on those measures. But it's not only in terms of guidelines or in terms of um, framework, but it's also in terms of resources to support government to engage in this direction. Uh, we know the Global Partnership um, for Education, which is the main mechanism of financing education services in the developing world, is also mobilized. A number of countries in our region has received additional resources to address some of the challenges that are there or that are linked to the prerequisite for school reopening. We have another mechanism called education come to wait and through which the member states and also some private um, philanthropes also provide resources to support education, mostly in the context of crisis. But we know COVID now is a crisis that comes across the world and they are stepping up also their support to countries. And we are seeing in many countries also, um, 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 UNICEF, WHO, other partner are stepping up their support, whether it is to enhance the availability of soap in school or um, availability, availability of waters or any facilities that can contribute to these conditions that are required for school reopening. But I just wanted to also mention that the issue of reopening school should not be only seen in terms of additional resources, additional material resources. I think there are issues that are linked to the organization classroom size, how you organize the shift, how you shift the space where the learning takes place. All of these things could be done at the level of the school, at the level of the community without requiring um, very much or additional uh, um, 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 financial or material resources. And we have seen also in many countries, Kenya, I don't know, many other examples of countries where governments, community, parents, teachers are working together to come with modalities that are preventive, but modalities also that help school to resume and minimizing all the risk of transmission that we have uh, um, um, spoken about. Now on the last point where they were saying that school children are emotional or, or difficult to go to, you know, when we talk about children, even my mandate and my heart, I am always very careful on the word to use. And as a father and as UNICEF, I just feel and look at them as uh, someone to be nurtured, someone to be cherished, and uh, any use of words that can, you know, give a connotation that could be negative or something, I would try to avoid, but I am sure that sometimes there are much more resilience that they will think. They can learn quickly, and by the way, everything that they learn today as a measure of prevention of this COVID and of this challenge, let's not forget that they will grow up with. And growing up with, they will transfer it to the next generation of society that we are going to. They can also learn things in terms of hygiene or individual uh, hygiene that they can transfer from school to home. We have seen it in many contexts. Let's look at children's more like an agent of change that can not only be uh, uh, um, part of those who are protected, but part of even those who contribute to help us to address the challenge of COVID. That's how I see them. And coming back to my words also of, uh, you know, nurturing them, cherishing them uh, um, as things that I would privilege rather than, you know, looking them at as a silent spreader or as a, as a emotional or too active to be managed. Back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fall. Dr. Moody, 
this one is from David Marbury, and I think it's very much a follow-up of the, the previous questions, but uh, David Mar Marbury from Farm Radio International wants to know about the major differences between urban and rural school settings when implementing the safe reopening of schools. What have you found? Dr. Mwetiti? Um, yes, thanks very much for that question. I think just before moving on to that, I, just a word on resources uh, to countries uh, to say that, you know, the major international development funders like the World Bank have offered billions of dollars to be available to countries for their responses, the multi-sectoral responses to COVID-19. And what we're trying to follow up is the extent to which some of this funding is being taken up. Some of it is grant money, a lot of it is soft loan money, and we've seen a, a, a kind of variety of ways in which countries are responding in, in taking up some of this funding. But, but what we've also seen, and, and if I can just add a plea, is that at the level of the UN, at the global level, there, there was a developed, I think Mohammed referred to the a framework on the socio-economic -im impact mitigation of the COVID-19, which has been relatively poorly financed. So, so, you know, in order for international agencies that are seeking funding from international partners to do their part to help to be able to, 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 to do so, it is necessary for them to be financed to do this. But personally, I'm very concerned about the socioeconomic impact of the virus in equally important to the health impact. So if I can just plug a plea for that, these, these uh, aspects of funding to be, to be financed by our partners. The WHO uh, plan is funded to 50% and we have a 200 million gap and we still have to see this virus through to a pandemic through to the end. Um, so, okay, that, that was just what, what I wanted to see. The differences between urban and rural school settings, I'm sure Mohammed could say more about this than, than I do, but I think in general, we can predict and assume that the conditions in the rural schools would be much more challenging in terms of being able to do some of this, uh, put in place some of the measures, because the resources generally are less in the rural areas in the region. Of course, what may work to advantage is that the, the virus in most African settings at the moment is relatively concentrated in urban areas, in those sort of overcrowded contexts in which transmission is easier. So it may be that the prevalence, the level of risk in the rural setting is less. And what happens then about schools, going back to the, to the idea of using data, needs to be guided by what is the local situation of the transmission of COVID-19 in this rural area. If it is not very intense, there are some rural areas where the virus has hardly reached, then you can imagine a relatively normal approach to going back to school with a strong uh, emphasis on monitoring the spread of the virus there and adapting quickly as we start to see that there is transmission either in clusters or community transmission. So I, my sense is that if we work in this differentiated, very targeted way based on data, the disadvantage in terms of uh, facilities in uh, rural areas might be offset by the fact that the intensity of spread of the virus may be less there, but we need to remain very vigilant. If we start to see upticks, then of course the, the measures need to be put in place. And I also think just, just to, to make a, uh, a remark following up on this, what we are going through now, the very difficult uh, experiences in all sectors of development really should trigger how to do things differently in the future. So for example, if we are dealing with uh, being able to do some remote learning, uh, ensuring accelerating access to some of the tools of learning in African countries, we know that there's a lot of innovation going on and we know that some of this, these tools can be provided at very minimal cost as can electricity, if we adopt certain ways of addressing some of these determinants of uh, development in the region. So my hope is that if we can use solar energy, some of the innovations that I've seen that are very low cost to provide electricity in homes and in schools, and if you can use some of the tools, including um, tablets that are relatively low cost, which, which some, some development partners are providing, we could leapfrog, if we like, the, the access to these ways of doing business, even in education in Africa. And I hope very much that this very difficult experience will help us to be more prepared to be innovative, to adopt innovations quickly, 
and to, to make these facilities available in an equitable way, even in the most disadvantaged context in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mwerti. Dr. Four, let's hear from you. What have been your findings about the differences, the distinctions between urban and rural settings? Um, first of all, just one thing. I think there are differences, but differences that we cannot just link to, to COVID because what we have seen is that, and I think it's across the board, that COVID has exacerbated differences that was pre-existing in society. We can see it in the level of uh, the way it spread, the, the way it impact on certain socioeconomic uh, um, category, the way it impact on countries and all. And I think that's exactly what we have seen. But as we say also, um, we have seen that the trajectory of the pandemic is different from one context to the others. At least when it comes to Africa, we have noticed that the, 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 the entry point has been the urban area. The bigger spread is most of the time the urban area and most of the time the capital. And for sure, that needs to be taken into account. But let's not forget also that pre-COVID, the sometimes schools in rural area or in um, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in in urban area had better situation than in rural area. And those differences in terms of access to power, access to um, digital platform, um, distance, for example, to school, um, some of the facilities that you could see in urban area was not existing in rural area in many instances, mainly in this part of the world. And I think those points should be uh, um, looked at also. And uh, as I say, many things that we are doing today in the responding to COVID are also extremely helpful in building back better. And what we mean by building back better is not only building the, soft, the system or supporting the system to stand in front of the challenge that we have today, but to look at also the big issues. And that's the point that I wanted to echo uh, um, 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 from uh, Dr. Moiti uh, when he's she saying that uh, in this context, let's not look at only the challenge, but let's look at also the broader opportunities that we are having. Um, probably digital learning was something um, that everyone was thinking about, but starting it in this part of the world was lagging behind. And I have seen so many initiatives that have helped to accelerate this process of maybe connecting school um, through digital platform. I know UNICEF, UNESCO, um, the International Union of Telecommunication have launched the initiative called GIGA, which is helping every school, mainly those that are um, most remote or more uh, vulnerable uh, 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 um, to have a possibility of internet connection. I see so many initiatives linked to uh, supplying power to um, um, solar panel um, into many parts of the continent or many schools just for the sake of getting a continuity of the learning process. One big learning also in throughout all this crisis is that uh, not only we are looking at the challenge, but we are looking at also opportunity that can help not only to address the, the, the challenge linked to the COVID, but the pre-existing issues, but to prepare also the children of today and the young people of today, maybe to face some upcoming challenge. Who knows that, or who can say that this is going to be the last crisis that mankind is going to face? Is it going to be our last pandemic? And any things that we have done today to address those challenges should be embedded also into the education, into the culture, into the way children of today are raised, so that at least it can prepare them as a future generation of uh, adults who can really help to handle possible upcoming crisis or possible upcoming outbreak. And that's the angle that I want to really insist on. And probably this could be my last message and the reason why it is important today to invest on children. It is not only to address the challenge that we are facing today, but how also it helped them to grow, how it helped them tomorrow to become the future adult that can help society um, to face any kind of complication or any kind of complex situation as the one we face today. And for which we have seen by many respect and by many regard that we were not prepared as a society to face a pandemic or a challenge of this scale, of this scope, and of this impact. Back to you. 
So Dr. Ford, let me just perhaps ask you this question as a final thought, and we'll get to final thoughts from Dr. Ngwe and Dr. Mwedi as well. But this question is from Gilbert Nakweya from Science and Technology Journalist in Nairobi, Kenya. It's a broad question, but I think you've all spoken to the unanticipated, unanticipated consequences of COVID-19. So the question is, what should we be worrying about most? I think it's about the unforeseen, unanticipated consequences. Just as your final word. What we should be worried more for me and from where I'm sitting as a father, and as an uh, international civil servant, is that uh, we lose a generation. And the reason why I'm thinking if today's education of these millions of children is compromised, this can translate into a lost generation. We are not just going to lose based on the impact, the direct impact of the pandemic on the health system, on the on the, on, the, uh, on the health system and on the social economic and in all work of life. But it is also that we lose a generation and lose a chance to prepare a generation to face future possible crisis. It is also the investment that UNICEF, WHO, all of us, we have done in the past year to improve children's well-being in terms of under five and infant mortality reduction, in terms of access to education, in terms of treatment of malnutrition. If we are not careful, all those gains we have, got, we have uh, uh, made after such a hard fight could be lost. And that notion of losing a generation and losing an achievement and a gain we have got in the past decade is the one that I fear most as I say, both as a father and as a UNICEF staff. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Dr. Ngoy, your thoughts on this? What should we be most worried about in regards to COVID-19 that we're either not aware of and how should we combat it? Yeah, on my side, I think what I'm really worried most right now is our own uh, thinking in general as a community. I think there is a kind of fatigue that is coming, bringing some kind of consistency in the community. And this is where I'm really worried. We might lose all the gain that Africa has gained so far in terms of the COVID impact on our social and economic uh, uh, sector. The other thing I think I want to echo uh, uh, that he said is, what I'm worried about is what lesson are we going to get out of the COVID? Is the next pandemic going to find us at the same place where we were? Or what good will come out of this one? I think this is a, this is a lesson to all of us, not only to leaders, uh, political leaders, but to each one of us, whatever uh, function we are exercising. So those are my two thoughts about that question. <clears throat> Dr. Mwedi, your final word of this, and I'd like to also include David McKenzie's question from CNN, because I think it ties in, because the question he's asking is, with a relatively low number of deaths due to COVID-19, would an extended closure of schools have an even more worse impact than the virus itself? Um, yes, that's a good question, because one, one of the, the concerns always has to be, you know, to address the problem and to make sure that we don't have, if you like, collateral impact that is worse than the problem itself. Unfortunately here, the methodology for addressing the COVID-19 in the context where you do not have the public health capacities where they needed to be just to identify cases, isolate them in their context, really has led to this, this, um, this need for these drastic measures which will have a, a huge socioeconomic impact. And this is the case worldwide, even in the most developed countries. So yes, I, and, and I think that we must, we must now be moving towards opening up economies because we've understood that the impact in different ways on education, on businesses, on women and their 
and their livelihoods of, of households is really going to be tremendous. But I think what we must emphasize is that we, we have to be guided by data in doing this as safely as possible. And we must, uh, we must be aware as well that we're now at the point where the governments are inevitably opening up uh, their, their, their economies. And we, will, we should anticipate to see an uptick of cases, but we need to manage those so that we don't see a kind of exponential increase well, that will set us back to where we were a few months ago needing to put back these drastic measures in place. Um, so, so yes, I, I very much sympathize with, with that question and say that we have to move forward to open up. Indeed, the cost has been huge, well beyond the health impact, but we must do so in such a way that we manage the health consequences and gain then from the high cost that uh, countries, uh, the economies are having to bear for this. And then secondly, I, I mean, just to say as my last word that um, starting with children, people, I agree very much with Mohammed that children can be such powerful agents of change. We need to look at if a kid hears something at school and they come back at home, they can be very persistent in reminding, but you know, you're not supposed to be with your mask around your chin. Do you have your mask on? Are we supposed to be washing hands here frequently? Children can be powerful agents of change. People are going to have to play a key role here as these lockdown measures are being eased. And what is very important is to see how they are enabled to do this. Uh, I keep coming back to this at every one of these press, co press conferences. The socioeconomic impact mitigation is so important. It needs to be uh, recognized in its rightful place and the resources need to be invested in that. People's livelihoods, people's access to food, people's access to masks. We can't assume that every family can be buying masks. Some families simply do not have the resources to do that. And I think the interventions really need to go down to that level so that these, so that the, the power of people who have internalized the message and have decided this is important for me to be able to take action is what is going to bring us to controlling this pandemic, even as we wait, and even if we have a vaccine, which hopefully will be equitably available to African people as well. So that is where I will, I will leave it as homework for all of us, for governments, for international development partners. Let's look at people, individuals, including children. They will make the difference to this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mwedi, and thank you as well to Dr. Paul. You've both given us a, a great deal to chew on and think about. And uh, to my media colleagues, apologies for not being able to ask all of your questions. We do try our best, but I uh, hope that you will join us again in next time. Thank you very much to our panelists, Dr. Matsidi Pumwetu, who's the WHO Regional Director for Africa, and uh, Dr. Mohamed Malik Fall is UNICEF's Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa. Dr. Nsenga Goy is the WHO COVID-19 Incident Manager. Thank you very much for your time and your contribution. That's the end of this briefing. Thank you very much for joining us. Do enjoy the rest of your day further.